Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is worship in spirit and truth. And I've been emphasizing the importance of the Holy Spirit in worship. It is, after all, the Holy Spirit who enables us to worship. Without the Holy Spirit, we would have no access into the presence of God. The Bible says that, of course, it was Jesus who opened the door for us to the presence of God through his death on the cross. But to make use of that open door, we need the enabling of the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit who inspires us to worship God. And one of the main works of the Holy Spirit is the inspiration of Scripture. The Sword of the Spirit series is entitled A School of Ministry in the Word and the Spirit. The Spirit and the Word always works together. And we see this in the inspiration of Scripture. God inspired people to speak God's Word and record God's words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Word of God is so important in worship. The Word of God reveals to us who God is. So we worship whom we know. It's not just imagining or guessing what God may be like and, and certainly not making images of Him so we have a physical representation to aid us in our worship. That's idolatry and it goes right against this teaching on worship in spirit and truth. So the scriptures reveal to us who God is and how we can approach Him. That's why an act of worship is reading the scriptures. And every day in our personal lives we should spend time in the scriptures which will enhance our worship and inspire our worship. That's why also I believe that no act of worship is complete without the scriptures. It's incomplete without the reading of the scriptures. That's why so often in public Christian worship services, the reading of Scripture and indeed the exposition of Scripture is a central part to that service. It's the Holy Spirit who inspires worship as we examine the Scriptures and hear what they say to us. Hello and welcome to the final session in this teaching in the Sword of the Spirit series, Worship in Spirit and Truth. And at the very last session, we were talking about how the Holy Spirit inspires scriptures so that those scriptures give to us the fuel for our praise and worship and enlighten us and bring us into the right understanding of things so that our worship is according to knowledge. Remember when Jesus taught about worship in spirit and truth. In John chapter 4, he spoke to the woman of Samaria and he said, you worship what you do not know, but we know, worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. He says, worship that is not based on the revelation of God is not true worship. And uh, there's one of the things we have to realize today. Many people are seeking a life of worship, and there is a discovery right across the world of a, of a spiritual dimension in the human race. And they're, they're talking about a new age of spirituality as people, even in the Western world, wake up to the fact that there is a spiritual quest at the depth of their being. But this spiritual quest is a thirst for spirit, a thirst for the Holy Spirit, and that can only be achieved through the revelation of God's Word. And so we must constantly see worship as that which informs our minds by the revelation of God's truth, inspires our hearts as that truth touches us deep on the inside of our being and how that truth is expressed in practical ways of obedience with that gospel obedience that I've spoken so much about during the whole of this series. And so the scriptures are central to every part of our life and faith as believers. But we turn to the scriptures because they are inspired by the Spirit and the Spirit is encountered as we meet with Him and as we look at the scriptures. Paul deals with this in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. And right the way there from verse 1 to verse 18, he talks about the ministry of the new covenant is the ministry of the Spirit. It's not the ministry of the letter. And uh, he says it's the, the, the Spirit gives life, but the letter kills. It's the ministry of death that, that mediates to us our knowledge and understanding of our sinful condition. But the Spirit of God resurrects us and brings us into the life and the glory of God. 
and the glory of God is not going to fade away in our lives. And then he says at the very end, he talks here from verse 617, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so he says, yes, the Word operates, but it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't turn to the Scriptures merely to a dead letter. This is the breathed, living, breathed out Word of God. And as we take the Word of God alive and activated by the Holy Spirit, we come to a place of worship. Then another great and significant role of the Spirit in worship is the Spirit is behind our horizontal dimension. In the last session, we spoke about fellowship in the Spirit. And that could mean fellowship with the Holy Spirit and also fellowship with one another because the Holy Spirit dwells in one another and dwells amongst us. And so here we see that the Holy Spirit is behind the vertical dimension of worship, inspiring us to worship God, but also he promotes the horizontal direction of our praise and worship and service. And that means that as we worship God, our concern is also to build one another up. And it's this vital, dynamic, free, open, confident, and fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit that brings corporate building up. But there is also a serious danger that's involved in this. In fact, when you think about worship, it's a wonderful, blessed, and glorious thing, but it's also a dangerous thing. Jesus said, be careful how you worship. Don't just worship with your lips. It's got to come from your heart. External worship is an offense to God. Remember in the Old Testament, God says, I hate your feasts. I hate your solemn assemblies. Away with all this stuff because they were worshiping only with the external part of their lives, not with the inner side of things. Now, there's another danger. The danger is that when there is the release of the Holy Spirit amongst us and we are ministering to the Lord and to one another in superlatively gifted ways, then the flesh can creep in and we can find ourselves very soon, again, displeasing God in the way that we worship. And the poor old Corinthians, they'd fallen foul of this as well, and it seems they did everything wrong. And yet, thank God for the opening verses where Paul calls them holy, and they are saved, they are, they are sanctified and set apart in Christ Jesus. But oh, they were, they were in such a mess in their church life. The outworking of their faith was so immature and undeveloped. He says, I can only speak to you as carnal believers. I wish I could speak to you as mature. I can't, I've got to teach you as kids. I've got to give you milk all over again. You should be having something stronger than that. And they got it wrong here in spiritual gifts as well. And in one sense, I'm glad that they did because it gives us the opportunity to have teaching that will correct our attitudes as we seek to worship God in the use of spiritual gifts. Now, what happens appears to me that they were uh, manifesting spiritual gifts in some kind of uncontrolled, ecstatic way. And I put the word ecstatic in inverted commas because I don't always agree with how scholars analyze this and use the word ecstasy here. The truth is, is that uh, they were somehow abusing the gifts of the Spirit, and I'm calling this ecstatic. And they had some manifestations of the Spirit that weren't hallmarks of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit manifests, the person is in control. And by that, I don't mean to say that at times there isn't a sense of, of overwhelming or that we feel beside ourselves, but we are not taken out of ourselves to the point where we don't know what we're doing or that we in some way behave in a way that's unseemly. Now, the unseemly behavior here is unseemly as God would judge it. I think sometimes when the Holy Spirit is moving in hilarious joy in the services and, and, and people are so exuberantly celebrating the joy of the Lord that those people who frown on the others and say, look at you, this is terrible. You people are drunk how you behave like that. That reminds us of what was said of the early believers at the day of Pentecost. So when we talk about order in the church, we're talking about God's order, not the order of man or the order of flesh or the order of a graveyard. And it seems that these people have valued tongue-speaking more highly than prophecy. And those who taught and brought messages uh, rather in a more uh, uh, kind of uh, regular sort of way 
or at the very least, it seems, that they favored the spectacular gifts which was so readily available to people filled with the Holy Spirit. Now notice in everything, when Paul corrects them, he does not speak against the gifts, and neither should we. The correction for abuse is right use, not non-use. And so he says, learn how to use these gifts properly. So they were then also denying three things. They were denying the rationality of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a rational spirit. The Holy Ghost brings the mind of God, and it's by the Spirit that we introduce to the mind of God. We're not talking about mindless emotion. We're not talking about spurious manifestation. Secondly, they were ignoring and denying the personality of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit's a person. Paul in other places says, don't quench him. He's like a fire. Don't grieve him. He's a person. And then he says, the morality of the Spirit. You are ignoring that. They were forgetting that he was the Spirit of Jesus who was also perfectly under control. This emphasizes, the emphasis rather on ecstatic manifestations seems to have led the Corinthians to conclude it didn't matter how they behaved as, lo uh, as so long as this was the supposed sign of divine inspiration. It also led them to exercise excessive show-off, at attention-seeking individualism. Those who didn't have the gift were jealous of those who did. And those who did were proud that they had the gift and showed off. And this damaged the sense of body life and fellowship. It damaged the interdependence and caused competition and division in the body of Christ. Now, in his first letter to the Corinthian church, after dealing with issues of division and unity, uh, with the practical problems they were facing in, in, in worship, such as the Lord's Supper, Paul deals with these questions now about spiritual gifts from 1 Corinthians 12 and onwards. First, he reminds them that ecstatic speech is not Christian. He says, you were carried away before your conversion by the worship of idols. The suggestion is here that they were taken over by a false spirit as they shared in their pagan feasts. This word here in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 2, apogemonai, Apogomenai, rather, is uh, maybe a suggestion that they were out of themselves. You were carried away when you were Gentiles. You were carried away to dumb idols, however you were led. And he says that is not a mark of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not bypass the human personality, because so often human beings say, now we are the ones who are going to tell you what the mark of the Holy Spirit is. We are sure that the Holy Spirit wouldn't possibly do that. That can't be the Holy Spirit. This can't be the Holy Spirit. People who are followers of God in Old Testament and New Testament times have missed the Holy Spirit many, many times for thinking like that. How could the Son of God come and be born in a stable? Surely he'd be born somewhere else. This can't be God. The Jesus who came, can this be the Messiah? Look, he's from Nazareth. Search the scriptures. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. There's no prophet comes out of Galilee. It was against the accepted thinking of the time. But that thinking was not God's thinking. It was human thinking. And when you dig deep into the word of God, you find, of course, there was a prophet coming from Galilee. And, and, and his birthplace was Bethlehem anyway, which was prophesied. And you find that when you study the scriptures with the mind of the Spirit, you find there the scriptures are being fulfilled by everything the Spirit does. This was behind the book that I wrote, the reason for writing the book, Revival Phenomena, so that we would not prejudge what was of God, what wasn't of God. But one of the ways of judging is finding out, is there this kind of loss of control in which the person is taken over by something alien to the Spirit of Christ? And so he says, uh, for example, if somebody says Jesus is accursed, that's not God speaking. I think we can sidestep the scholarly discussion as to whether this actually happened. It's possible that it did happen, which was a sign of, of demonization in, 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 the, in the church at that particular time, that somebody stood under the influence of a demonic spirit, exercised public worship in this way, or it could be a reference to what was happening in the pagan feasts. Wait, we don't know. But the simple fact is this, that the way to test that the Holy Spirit's involved is what place does Jesus have in it? Is Jesus being honored? And so, 
Paul begins to correct this, and he says, you've got to understand certain principles. First of all, he says, these gifts are charismata. Now, you should recognize that word. We've had it several times in the Sword of the Spirit series. I mentioned it in the last session, at least part of the word charis, which means grace. Charismata means that which is linked to grace. That's what it means specifically, that which is linked to grace, that which grace produces. Here, it's in particular, the good translation is gifts of grace. Or, and some people talk about this as spiritual gifts, because the grace is the grace of the Holy Spirit. These charismata, gifts of grace, are linked with the Holy Spirit. Secondly, he says, we call these things diakonia. We should have recognized that word also. It's the word where we get the English word deacon from. Diakonia means one who serves another under their authority. Acts of lowly service. They're associated with Jesus the Son. Then there is the word ener ener energema, which it means empowering, which comes from, the, from God the Father. These are mighty workings. So he says they are gifts of grace. He says they are working, this acts of service, they are the operations of service, and he says also they are the workings of God, the powerful supernatural workings of God. And so this proves that spiritual gifts and the action of God operating through these things again works in partnership with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we find that this proves that spiritual gifts we receive are given by the given by the supreme gift of grace. They're not possessions that we use ourselves. They're not rewards for good behavior. They're tools which are intended for diakonia, for service, for the service of others, after the pattern of the one who was anointed with the Spirit without limit and was the foot-washing servant of God. And when this service is effective, when it helps others, when it builds them up and heals them, it's not due to our holiness or our talent. It's only due to the empowering that God has given to us. And then Paul develops this argument by telling the Corinthians that the Spirit gives different gifts to every member of the body of Christ. And there are different manifestations, but these different manifestations are for the common good. Don't forget the context is to show that our worship should be there to build one another up, not to show off our spiritual talents or even our natural talents. They're not there for us to boast. They are there for us to lead people closer to Jesus. And that, that's one of the hallmark tests of whether these gifts are, number one, from God, and number two, are being used truly in submission to the Lord. And so he says, we must see the declaration in verse 3, Jesus is Lord. This proclamation points unmistakably to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, the gift must point unmistakably to the person of Christ. And then we see that the next test is, does the manifestation benefit and build the church? It's imperative that we grasp the content of the proclamation and the results in the community of God's people are the two most important tests by which we measure our words, our claims, and our experience and activity. In other words, the proof of the pudding, as we say in England, is in the eating. And so, does it contain the content which honors Christ, is it Christ exalting? And secondly, is it edifying? Does it really build up the body of Christ? And so, God then says that this unity is in diversity, and the diversity enhances the unity. God is the source of all the different manifestations of the one Holy Spirit in the, in the, in the body of His Son. And these manifestations are called Energemeta, workings, when the emphasis on what God do, when, when the emphasis is on what God does. They're called charismata, when the emphasis is on what the Holy Spirit does, uh, his gracious gift of distribution. And they are called diakonia, when the emphasis is on the, the fact that these gifts are empowerings of God intended for the service of others. And so we cannot think like this without uh, recognizing the Bible's teaching on the body, the body teaching, the body of Christ. In verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. I want you to uh, help me read it again, listen again, because 
is a very important point that's about to come up. For as the body is one, and as many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now, here we have the Bible's teaching of what makes up the members of the body of Christ. It's those who are spirit-anointed. And uh, spirit-baptized believers are those who take up their place within the body of Christ. He says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, uh, whether Jews, Greeks, whether slaves are free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. And so what makes us one is that not that we have received impressive gifts, but that we've all been immersed into Holy Spirit, and He has been poured out into our lives. And then that's what makes verse 12 so important, because he says that just as the body is one, and just presumably by that he means the human body, and the human body has many members, so, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Now, he doesn't say you'd expect him to say, if you're reading it through, you'd expect him to say, so it is with the church, because the body of Christ is the church. So you'd expect him to say, just as there is one body and many members, and, and one body has many members, but the many members make up one body, so it is in the church. You'd expect him to say that, because he implies that, and that's his teaching. But here, he says, so it is with Christ. So that tells us that the church is not just any kind of body, not just a human society. It is the embodiment of Jesus. Whatever the church is, whatever it is, it is as power, the presence, and the activity of Jesus. He is the one in whom all believers are incorporated. It is the body, yes, but it's the body of Christ. And that's why one of Paul's favorite descriptions is of, of our lives as believers is that we are in Christ. And so he says that if you belong to Christ, you belong to each other. And, and uh, he, there's nobody that does not belong to the church uh, that doesn't also belong to Christ. And he's showing them that this divisive spirit is affecting Christ personally. He actually says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? He says, you should be thinking about Jesus. And every time distinctions come amongst you, even if they're the distinctions of saying, look what spiritual gifts I've got on my lapel today. That boasting, that kind of, well, pride and arrogance is dividing and tearing up the body of Christ. But we should all acknowledge and remember that there's equally no place for jealousy. One of the biggest problems in Christian ministry is jealousy. As ministers, we all find it hard not to be jealous of somebody else's gift. And there you are looking at this preacher and you're saying, my, 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 I wish I could preach like that. How dare the Holy Spirit use him so powerfully? And then when you stand up and preach, the other brothers probably thinking the same thing about you. And the devil gets at us through this jealousy. The jealousy brings division. Paul encourages those who feel they are inferior members of the body and explains that all members are equally important and we depend upon them all. In fact, he corrects those with a superiority complex by looking down at other people and saying, listen, you got it from God. But he also corrects those with the inferiority complex to say, even what, if you consider yourself to be of lesser significance, remember, even in the body, we give greater honor to the most unpresentable part. So if you think you're an unpresentable part of the body of Christ, then you get greater honor. So God is saying, listen, whether little gift, big gift, prominent gift, unseen gift, if it's in God, if it's in the Holy Spirit, Jesus gets all the glory and the church is built up anyway. And so we need to find our place in the body of Christ. And as Paul says in Romans chapter 12, don't think of yourself more highly. Don't think of yourself more highly to attain to things that God has not given to you. Be who you are and what you are in Christ. But then at the same time, he implies, think soberly. Don't think too lowly of yourself. This is to say, I've got a spiritual operation, but I'm not going to now present that because I'm just a humble believer. I'm just a backseat person in the body of Christ. And before you know where you are, you, you, you're so humble that you're embarrassing to know. But that's not true humility. That's false humility. Humility.